Well, welcome everybody to uh, our look at transformational leadership. The idea of transformational leadership is really important to us. DevOps started off as a grassroots movement and uh, really was very much just a matter of engineers figuring out what are some great ways to work and coming up with the tools and all the different things that needed to happen. But it became pretty clear uh, that it was more than just a grassroots thing. If you wanna make any kind of a significant impact on an organization, it does require leadership. Uh, and so that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, and actually this topic was highlighted in the State of DevOps report a few years back, a couple of years back actually, two years back. Um, they called out as one of their key uh, messages in the 2017 State of DevOps report, the need for transformational leadership. And in fact, I have the quote down here uh, in the bottom part of this slide here. Uh, the characteristics of transformation, transformational leadership um, are highly correlated with IT performance. And uh, that actually was really an important message here. You know, the idea that leadership is, it's not just the technology. It's not just a matter of working in, uh, in technical ways. Uh, it's not a matter of the tools, uh, but indeed it really is a matter of leadership as well. Uh, this is the directed graph that they had in the State of DevOps report. Over here on the left-hand side is transformational leadership and these five attributes, which of course is what we're gonna be looking at here, but essentially showing how they enable all these things that lead over here on the right-hand side to IT performance and organizational performance. Um, so that's really what this is about. Uh, now, it's important for us to recognize that when they use the term leadership, they did not just have in mind the idea of senior leadership. Of course, senior leadership is critically important. Uh, it's kind of hard to get any of the ducks in a row if you don't have senior leadership on board with you. But what they had in mind here was anyone who has a leader role anywhere in the organization. So this talk is actually for any of us who have a leader role in our organizations here. Yes, if you are in the senior ranks of the organization, absolutely, I want to talk to you. But also anyone who is a, a manager or a technical lead or a team lead or lead in any uh, form, uh, e even if it's just an opinion leader uh, in your organization. Uh, these are key characteristics that are going to be necessary to help your organization then to be successful in implementing DevOps and ultimately achieve uh, really high IT performance, which leads to high organizational performance. So that's really what we're talking about here. Um, the other half of this quote I have down here, teams with the least transformative leaders, and they, they specifically said the bottom third of, of the, uh, the survey results that they had, were half as likely to exhibit high IT performance. So not only do these attributes lead to high performance, but if they're lacking, they tend to impede the ability of the organization to achieve high performance. So that's really what we're going to be talking about here. Now, these five attributes, um, I mean, they all kind of sound like what you would expect to see. But what I want to really look at is, is what do they look like uh, on the ground, for the, especially for those of us who have leadership roles in the organization? What does it look like for these things to be part of what we're doing? So the first one I want to touch on here is vision. So that was, that was actually just the single word vision. And in the report, they explain it this way over here, having a clear concept of where the organization is going and where it should be. So that's really what they meant when they talked about vision here. It is clearly an important role of anyone in a leadership kind of a position to help the folks that they are leading to have a vision of where we are going. Where are we trying to get to? Uh, where do we expect to go to or where do we expect to be? And in fact, they uh, specifically talk about this idea of a five-year horizon. 
right? Where do we expect to be a few years from now? And indeed, what do we want to be pushing towards? The reason why this is so important for a high performance organization is because it's about the only way that everyone in the organization is going to be able to be pulling in the same direction. Now, clearly, senior leadership is going to be providing that big picture that the whole organization is going to be able to follow. But it really does fall to the leaders further down the food chain to operationalize that, essentially to take that, that vision of where the organization is going and then translate that into, well, what does that mean for us as a department? What does that mean for us as a team? What does it mean for us as a group of people who are just part of this bigger organization? So essentially translating that big picture vision into what does that mean for us and what vision should we have for our particular work that we are engaged in, in support, of course, of the larger organization. So that's really what it translates into. Not only does the leader need to understand that big picture, but also need to be able to translate it into the local needs to be able to really communicate that vision uh, at a nuts and bolts level to the folks who are working you know, in, in a particular team, uh, whatever uh, sphere of control that particular leader happens to have. So that's the starting point here. And, and I love the fact that this is actually the first one that they talked about because indeed without the vision, all the rest of them aren't really going to make a lot of sense because people are going to be pulling in all different directions. The vision is actually what helps us all to pull in the same direction. All right. Um, and I, by the way, I welcome Please do put stuff into the chat, especially since we have a few extra minutes here. Uh, any insights or examples that any of you have, uh, definitely do that. And of course, as Chris said, uh, throwing questions in the chat or the Q&A is definitely welcome. So vision is the first of the five, uh, five attributes that they talked about. The second, I kind of feel like it comes directly from the first one because having a vision is only the beginning of it. You need to be able to communicate, right? And that is actually the second of the attributes that they called out here is inspirational communication. And I love the fact that they use the word inspirational because it's not just about communicating, but it's about communicating in a way that will indeed inspire and motivate. In fact, that's the, the actual term that they used, right? A way that inspires and motivates. Um, so providing, uh, you know, the, the guidance of, oh, this is our vision, this is what we're doing, but this, um, this is why, essentially, is what it comes down to, uh, to, to get the troops uh, all fired up, wanting to, uh, to move in the direction that we need to move. Um, so now they, they highlighted a couple of very interesting points here. So the first one is inspiring pride in just being a member of the team. Right. So it's one thing to say this is the direction that we're going, but it's another way to be communicating that in a way where it's like, yes, yes, that's where we're going. I really, really want to be part of this thing that's moving in this direction. So communicating what that vision is and where we are going and what we're doing in a way that really helps the team members to latch on to that and to want to be on that train. Another part of it, though, they kind of, and this almost turns it around, saying positive things about the team. So, you know, being, you know, having pride that you are a part of the team, uh, you know, it's like, I want to be on this train. But the leader also needs to essentially help the team members to really be um, connected with uh, how they feel about the team. You know, to, to say, look, there are some positive things here, especially every team you know has challenges they things go wrong you know whatever even in those kind of situations here you want to also say and but there are positive things and keep those positive messages coming for the team here um it is a matter of the passion the motivation you know and t having it first but then being able to communicate that these things are really, really important, not just to the organization at large, but important to us as members of the team. 
right? So that's really what inspirational communication comes down to is how we actually bring this information to the team in a way that inspires and in a way that actually motivates the team to move in the directions that we want to be able to move. So those first two really do go together, the vision and the inspirational communication. Now the next one takes us in a different direction. Intellectual stimulation. When I read this one, I kind of went, yes, this is the kind of uh, an environment that I would want to work in. Uh, you know, you really want to say, I, I don't want to just be rote following the rules. I don't want to just be doing the same thing day in and day out. I actually want to start challenging things. And notice that in the three bullets, first off, the, the summary is challenging followers, but then each of the three bullets is about challenging. Right. So challenging the status quo, right? The way we do things. Okay, cool. We got to the way we do things because we said, hey, this is probably a good way for us to do things. But keeping up with just the way things are is not how a team becomes a truly high performance team. It's always, you know, looking for and how can we get better, regardless of how good things are. Now, obviously, if there's challenges, of course you'd wanna be saying, and what can we do about it? But even when there aren't challenges, even when the, it's not obvious that there are ways that we can be improving, we still wanna be challenging that. Is this really the best that we can do? Is this really uh, something, the standard we want to settle for? And I, I do like to think of it in terms of settling for those challenges. And that then leads to this next one here, the idea of, challenging the team to ask new questions, right? We got to where we are, we got to our status quo by asking and answering certain questions. Well, the way we're gonna move beyond the status quo is to ask new questions. Um, what questions should those be? I don't know. And that's the cool part about it here is challenging the team to be asking new questions. Of course, as a leader, I would wanna be asking new questions as well, but don't restrict it to just yourself asking those questions. Encouraging team members to be constantly posing new questions. Encouraging the team members to be thinking in very, very different ways about things and to be raising questions. And some of the questions, you know, it's like, oh yeah, that, that was a dumb question, that's okay. I love dumb questions because sometimes the dumb questions are the ones that come up with some of the greatest ideas. Stimulating intellectual approaches to things. That's really what we're talking about here. And then the third challenge is challenging basic assumptions. And this is a really hard one because we all have a history. We all you know, have things that we have learned through experience over time and that really builds our model, our mental model of how things work and how we should be operating and all of that. It's really, really hard to challenge those basic assumptions. It's really, really hard to challenge those ideas that may have served us well up to this point, but are they gonna continue to serve us well as we move forward? So essentially, Notice the common theme here. The common theme is the word challenge because the, the best way to move forward is indeed if people are thinking, I hate to use a, a, a well-worn phrase outside the box, but that's really what we're talking about here. Get out of the dang box, right? Get challenging your team to, uh, to step outside of the box and see what else there could possibly be here. So definitely the challenge. Now, the next direction they go is supportive leadership. So the idea here is kind of a human angle on this whole thing. Uh, for many of us, this is a challenge because um, many of us in the tech field are all about the technology. We, we aren't such touchy feely kind of people and yet, that actually makes for the best leadership is when we actually pay attention to the members of our teams from a personal perspective here. So uh, notice the words that are used here, care and consideration of people's 
personal needs and feelings. Um, for, some, for some of us, and I, and I definitely would include myself in this particular area here, this doesn't come naturally. This is something that, um, that I would need to think about and I would need to, uh, to I actively work on is really what it comes down to. That's one of the cool things that I have found over the years is that the things that don't come natural to, naturally to me, I can still do because if I pay attention to these things, I recognize, oh yeah, that's right. That wouldn't be my natural reaction. And yet if I do it, it is going to be the best thing for the situation, for my team, for the folks I'm working with. So stepping outside of our comfort zone. Of course, if your comfort zone is there, you definitely want to capitalize on it. So, um, so for instance, this first bullet here, thinking about how people are going to feel about things before you take the action. I mean, it's one thing to realize, oh, I just stepped on somebody's toes. But it's another thing to really be thinking about before I take this action, how are my team members going to be uh, going to be responding to that? Um, because that helps us then to frame our actions or frame our words in a way that actually is going to be inspirational and really going to help people to see where we want to go and be proud to work for the team. All these things that we just talked about in those prior pages. Um, thoughtful of others, personal needs. It's not just about doing the work, right? People are not just pairs of hands. You know, people come, you know, with their brains attached and they come with uh, all the things that make them human attached to it. And so recognizing the fact that it isn't just about doing the work. It is indeed about us being human with each other and working with each other. And of course, the idea of interests outside of work, right? Connecting with each other. Uh, and again, some of us are really, really good at that. I mean, it comes really naturally for some of us and for others of us, not so much. So I uh, definitely want to, uh, here I'm speaking to myself, pay attention and think about these things and really be very much uh, connected with them. Um, so I'm just noting here that Michael put a, a, a note in the uh, chat window here, uh, going back to the prior page about challenging the teams here. Uh, he's also talking about uh, challenge the corporate antibodies to change. <laughs> That's true, though, there are defense and he mentions the defense mechanisms, you know, and all of those kind of things. And this is actually a role of leadership as well, essentially recognizing what are the parts of the organization or what are the attributes of the organization and the leaders of the organization that would actually get in the way of people thinking differently, th people stepping outside of their constraints. So uh, that was a, a great comment, Michael. Thank you. All right, so we have our supportive leadership. And then there's personal recognition. Um, and th this is actually the, uh, the last of the five here. Uh, and it, again, it's a connection with people here and we wanna make sure that people recognize that we do appreciate the work that was done. But notice that it's not just about appreciating uh, over the top excellence. I mean, obviously, you always want to appreciate great, excellent work here. Um, so first off, they highlight this idea of uh, acknowledging achievement of goals and uh, acknowledging any improvements. And I love how that one is worded. Uh, the idea of, you know, we're better than we were. We may not have achieved the ultimate. We may not be uh, the, the most the greatest that we could possibly be, but we have moved in that direction. So any improvement in what we're doing here, uh, that is something we also want to recognize, um, especially if we haven't achieved what we ultimately want to achieve here, but recognizing that we have made some progress, uh, that is going to stimulate more movement in that same direction here. Uh, personally complimenting when people do outstanding work. Uh, and, and literally it is a matter of, of making it personal, right? Anyone who has put in the extra effort, you wanna make sure that they recognize that, that they know they have been appreciated. Again, it goes back to that the human side of it. 
Um, so, and these bullets paint kind of restate pretty much the same things that were there. So it is a matter of, of reaching out to the team members and uh, making them feel personally um, appreciated for the work that they're doing and especially anything that that represents either an achievement or a move in the direction of achieving the kind of things that we want to try to achieve. So with that in mind, those are the five pieces of this inspirational leadership that we're talking about here. Vision, uh, uh, inspirational communication, intellectual stimulation, uh, supportive leadership, and of course, personal recognition. Those are the pieces of inspirational leadership. Now, why is this important? Uh, as I said, the data that they came up with in the State of DevOps report highlighted uh, that it actually correlates with the kinds of things that we're trying to achieve uh, in our DevOps uh, implementations here. And this is kind of how they wrapped it up here. The transformational leadership uh, essentially sets up these things. So there's the, the five elements that we just talked about there. But first off, it establishes and supports the kind of cultural norms that we are looking for. Um, we talk a fair amount in the DevOps community about culture, about culture being a necessary part of achieving the kind of things we're trying to achieve and achieving high IT performance in our organizations. And indeed, it's this form of leadership that does set the stage for those kinds of, for that kind of a culture, a generative uh, and high trust culture. So that's actually one of the first reasons why this is necessary. Um, it also, when it comes to putting the technologies and tools and the new processes and all of those things in place in order to make these things happen, this actually enables those things to happen. DevOps is about rethinking how we do our work and thinking in a different way and in embracing new kinds of approaches and new tools and new, new ideas uh, about how to do work. And indeed, this kind of a leadership approach actually enables those kinds of changes to go on. So even the nuts and bolts technology part becomes easier with this kind of leadership going on. It supports experimentation. You know, when you talk about Gene Kim's three ways, the third way is, is experimentation, right? Continuous learning and experimentation. And the experimentation is actually where you achieve the really, really big benefits out of DevOps. And this is the kind of leadership that's going to enable that to happen. And finally, breaking down the silos. When you have this kind of leadership, it actually invites people to step outside of whatever silos that they might have. It actually invites uh, people to actually break down those silo walls to reach across boundaries and to work with other people in the organization in order to make all these things happen. So yes, indeed, uh, this is why this transformational leadership style does correlate with high IT performance and does correlate with the ability of an organization to perform well, because it indeed it sets us up to be able to do the things that we're talking about doing here as part of DevOps. So that's what I have here. Uh, I got one really good comment from Michael. Thank you in the, uh, in the chat. Um, I would welcome any other uh, ideas that any of you have, and of course, any questions that anyone would like to, uh, to throw out there. Thanks, Alan, that was a really good presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, so we're done just a few minutes early, although uh, not too bad. Um, Alan, we appreciate it very much. We've got a few minutes, so we'll hang out. Uh, as we said, feel free to ask any Q&A in the chat window. Um, appreciate the, the remark there, Vanessa, uh, for your kind words. Um, anybody else who wants to chat with Alan or ask questions, uh, he's got a few minutes here to take your questions, so feel free to post those in the chat and we'll get you connected with them. Um, we've got um, one question sorry. in the uh, we've got I, one I was just going to go to the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, good. All right, you can see the Q and A, so uh, so I'll let you take that. Um, yeah. And so, uh, so the the question in the Q and A is: Do you think an engineering leader necessarily has to know how to code to be a good leader? Uh, from your talk, my guess is no. And I, I you definitely read me correctly there. <laughs> um, obviously, a, a person who has a technical background uh, is going to be able to really connect with technical people really well. Uh, but no, I don't think it's an absolute necessity uh, for for a technical leader to be a technical expert in any way. And in fact, sometimes some of the best leaders uh, that you see in a technical environment are the people who uh, are not technical experts. And in fact, they make a big deal of, oh, you are the expert and, and you know, you're, you're the ones I'm counting on to do this work and I'm providing leadership for you. So, uh, so definitely uh, you, you read me correctly on that one. Uh, technical knowledge is useful but not necessary. Um, so uh, and and uh, so Michael threw his uh, question into the Q and A there. Uh, you know, what do you do to avoid those corporate can antibodies? So he had put that comment in the, in the chat window there. Um, I guess I didn't give a direct answer on that because I don't have any magic that I can that I can quote on how to make those kind of things happen. Um, so what he says here is, uh, how do you avoid the corporate antibodies from rejecting us as change agents? Um, my favorite approach to that sort of a problem really comes down to um, um, emphasizing whatever um, wins that the organization actually gets. Um, it doesn't guarantee that the uh, the whoever is uh, is uh, kind of spewing out those antibodies uh, is actually going to get it and and grasp the idea here. And I've seen many cases when it doesn't. But that's the best thing I know of is any any uh, benefit that the organization gets from some of the things that we've done. Uh, broadcast that. Make it make that. Uh, very, very visible. Uh, and that's your best hope at winning over support for the work that you're trying to do as a change agent. Um, okay, so next question is, uh, how does a servant leader compare or contrast to a transformational leader? They actually specifically mentioned that in the state of DevOps report. And I didn't, I didn't lift that quote from that. So I can't actually quote what the report was saying here. Um, but it boils down to a servant leader is a matter of I am leading the team by supporting the team and doing things for the team. You know, I'm serving the team and that is how I'm leading it. And what they were highlighting is a transformational leader is much more out in front of the team than a servant leader is. So they did draw that distinction between the two. It's the approach that's different. Um, they're both actually, I, I think they're both really uh, positive things, but a, a servant, the term servant leader does have a more um, back behind the team where a transformational leader more out in front. So I guess that's the big difference. And I do point you to the 2019 State of DevOps report because they de did have a paragraph in there that specifically addresses this. Uh, Vanessa asked, do you have any favorite productivity tools that you find help enable the supportive systems you were talking about on your last slide? Um, I don't really have a favorite tool that I would point to. Um, obviously, anything that is going to enable the team to collaborate with each other, and there's a whole raft of tools that fall into that category, um, I think is going to be a useful thing. Um, it, I mean, it's one thing to inspire the team to to uh, to you know reach out for better things, uh, but having the team collaborate, having the team members connect with each other, uh, I think is going to be the best way to make that work. So, don't have a particular tool, but I would say anything that is uh, designed to facilitate collaboration, I guess, would be the direction I would go. Any tips on getting more of a vocal group? I lead a younger DevOps group eh, that can be what I consider shy. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, boy, that's a good question here. Um, and uh, honestly, I thinking to my experience in that kind of situation, I know how frustrating it is. And I've never been able to really crack that nut. <laughs> uh, so if any of you actually has a good answer uh, for Ryan on that, uh, uh, please do at, uh, you know, add that to the chat or whatever, because that's a nut I don't know how to crack. Uh, so, okay, Michael uh, is commenting some more on the uh, the antibodies <laughs> change that is too fast looks like a cancer. Uh, change is scary and it does provoke, pro uh, promote those kind of responses. That's true, that's true. Uh, change for the most part, in most organizations, you really do have to take things slow, slower uh, to get people on board because you're right, change is scary. Uh, that's kind of a, you know, resistance to change is something that we always talk about in the organizational change world. Um, most people um, are going to react in a negative way when they are facing something that is that scary unknown out there. Um, so, so moving slowly and deliberately, in addition to the broadcasting of, of all the wins, it, I, I think those things need to go together. Uh, tips on motivating people to, to get out of the box <laughs> um, and to continue to do it. So what I'd like to do is point to examples of it, I think. Uh, you know, when, whenever you see it, and it's not just on the team, obviously anyone on the team who steps outside of a box, I definitely want to highlight that to the whole rest of the team. But even if it's not somebody on the team, even if it's somewhere else in the organization or any example you can come up with, uh, I, I think that's the best way is to uh, put those things out there as examples and uh, you know, highlight the fact that yeah, this is this is really what we're looking for here, uh, with this kind of situation. Um, so I'm, okay, now I'm looking down here at the uh, the chat window here. Okay, so Joe says one idea would be to get anonymous feedback from team members. They might be more comfortable with that. That's true. That's true. Uh, sometimes not speaking publicly is the answer, especially for the more shy uh, members of the team. Uh, in fact, okay, so Vanessa says, as a shy developer myself, I felt naturally emerging from my shell a little more when a trusting environment was established. Yes. Uh, supportive team members had my back easier to emerge a little, uh, learn and make mistakes, give me encouragement. And the, the term we use for what Vanessa is talking about there in the chat um, is a safety culture where, you know, literally you can step out and do something unexpected. You can make mistakes, uh, whatever, and it's safe for you to do it. And the only way to really establish a safety culture is in your own uh, reactions to things. Uh, but I think that's a really important part. Thank you, Vanessa. You're uh, definitely uh, highlighted a, a really important point. <laughs> and Chris, Chris agreed. <laughs> Yeah, Paul talks about asking people specific questions by name. Uh, and sometimes people will react very positively to that idea of, of you know, being asked a very specific question. Um, not always. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the very shy people will feel put on the spot. So you do have to be careful with that kind of an approach. Uh, but for many people, it actually can be a good way to get them to speak up when it, it, it's kind of funny how often people are sitting there thinking, should I say this or should I not say this or, you know, and, and an invitation is all they need for them to step out. Um, so, <clears throat> Ooh, so back to the Q&A here, Daryl asked, do you have any good examples of transformational leaders or leadership in today's tech culture? Wow. You know, I, I, I've read a lot of good things about Musk. You know, Elon Musk uh, definitely challenges his people to think about things in very different ways. Uh, some of the um, 
amazing things that the company has been able to do. Uh, I mean, obviously he comes up, he's very much uh, inspirational when it comes to coming up with crazy ideas and then helping people to do them. But you, you know that his own people uh, are thinking outside the box and are really coming up with great ideas. So I, I think uh, he would be the person I would point to based on the little I know about him. I, mean, I don't know a, a great deal about him. All right, uh, Gabriel says, as a young developer, I've had a lot of situations where I feel like my input was shut down. Uh, a variant of shut up kid, what do you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly, one of the things that I've always tried to do is, um, is to recognize and uh, appreciate whatever anybody says, even if it's a, a suggestion that we can't take uh, even if it's something we can't do or uh, somebody else came up with a better idea, so we're going to go some other direction. I still want to uh, help people to st still feel comfortable with coming up with their ideas. So so uh, being appreciative of the idea, even when it's an idea that we can't do. Uh, but I definitely don't want to shut somebody down just because they're uh, less experienced. Some of the less experienced people come up with the best ideas. <laughs> 